Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. For the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the different attachment styles we have in relationships, what they look like, how we develop the style we have, and how we can take steps to heal any attachment wounds we may have so that we can feel secure in our relationships. Last week, we talked about attachment styles to God with Catherine Queering, and several of you found the information insightful but said you didn't fully understand the different attachment styles and wanted more information so that you could better assess how you related with others as a child. And if you haven't done much conscious work with your attachment, it's probably how you still relate with those around you today. Several of you also said that you found yourself listening and thinking, wait, that's how I relate with my dad or my mom. Yeah. You usually learn your attachment style from your childhood. Some researchers believe our primary attachment develops between the age of zero and two, but that can be altered by significant events throughout our lives because our brains aren't static. They're plastic, which means they continue to change as our environments change. So you may have grown up with one attachment style as a child, but if you had a significant or usually a traumatic relationship in your you know, late childhood or in your adulthood, that can change your attachment style. So it is possible for attachment styles to change over time. And that's good news for us because if we grew up with an insecure attachment style, then it's possible to heal that and to learn to relate with people in a secure way. Over the next several episodes, we're going to go over the four styles of attachment starting today with secure attachment so that you can discover your style of relating to others. Personal development coach Tyus Gibson, I hope I'm saying that right. She never says her name, but it looks like it's Tyus, T-H-A-I-S, Gibson. She describes our attachment styles like the subconscious rules we bring into our relationships. She says that relationships with different attachment styles can feel like sitting down to play a board game with some of us playing with the rules of Monopoly and others of us have the rules for Scrabble. And when we have different rules about how relationships should go, it can create a lot of confusion and conflict. She and several psychologists believe that understanding your attachment style may be the most important information you can have to help you navigate a healthy relationship, whether it's with your significant other out in the dating world, with your parents, with your children, or even with your friend group. Now, before we dive in, I have a quick ask of you. If you feel this podcast has helped you feel more compassion for yourself as you heal from the effects of high-demand religion, and if you feel it's a resource you'd like to see continued and expanded, please pause for a moment and make a donation towards our weekly research and broadcasting at emancipateyourmind.org. On the website, there's a box labeled support the podcast and give a gift where you can quickly and easily make a tax deductible donation. Those who choose to become monthly donors will also have access to our live weekly call and weekly email with additional exercises and tools to help you continue to heal your relationship with yourself and others as you deconstruct high demand religious indoctrination. All right, so Let's talk about the background of attachment theory first. Okay, so just bear with me. It's time for me to geek out for just a minute. Where did this idea about attachment come from? Now, psychologists and researchers have been talking about attachment theory for almost 100 years. Back in the 1930s, a psychiatrist named John Bowlby, he worked in a pediatric psychiatry clinic with emotionally disturbed children. And he began to wonder what these children all had in common that had led them to be in this psychiatric unit. 
And he began to observe relationships between the children and their primary caregivers, usually their mothers. He wanted to understand the anxiety and distress that children experience when separated from their caregivers. At the time, the leading researchers and philosophers thought that attachment between mother and child was simply from like behavioral learning. Because the mother fed the child, the child was attached to the mother. Freud took it a little bit further and said that infants were born with an oral fixation and that the mother's nipples provided a relief for that fixation, which is what created attachment between mother and child. But Bowlby found that while feeding children in the hospital, it didn't diminish their separation anxiety. So it had to be something more than just feeding. It needed to be something more than food. He found that proximity to their primary caregiver was usually what helped these children emotionally regulate and feel comforted. So it wasn't just being provided food or shelter or clothing. There was something else happening. While other researchers believed that attachment was a learned behavior, in the 1950s, Bowlby looked at attachment through the lens of evolution. He believed that infants developed attachment with their caregivers in order to get their needs met and improve their chances of survival. We've talked about this a lot on this podcast, that the patterns of behavior we created as a child, our inner child wounds, our inner child patterns, those come from an attempt to get our needs met for survival. If we knew that we were more likely to get our needs met if our parents were emotionally regulated and able to be present with us emotionally so that they could cook our food or could comfort us or could meet our emotional needs, then we were going to flex and change our behavior in order to make sure that our parents stayed as regulated as possible. Or as we'll discover in a later episode, we may have withdrawn our expectations of care completely and developed an avoidance style of attachment. We may have decided these people are too unpredictable. I can't trust anyone to meet my needs. And so I'm not going to expect anything from anybody. I'm not going to allow anyone to get close to me because that's just too painful. All of these attachment styles, no matter what they are, were meant to get our needs met, depending on the abilities of our caretakers to meet our needs. So while behaviorists at the time thought that it was food that drove attachment, it was Bowlby, and later, this was built upon by Mary Ainsworth in the 1960s and 70s, they discovered that it was actually nurturance and responsiveness that drove human attachment. So this is the reason why whenever you go to a therapist or whenever you do coaching with somebody who deals with trauma, so often it's going to go back to your childhood. We're not trying to blame everything on your caregivers, but so many of the patterns that, you know, drive our adult relationships and our, you know, adult feelings of self-worth come from the ways that we managed our environment as children, the ways that we were taught to think about ourselves and others, how safe we felt the world was, how safe we felt it was to explore. So this attachment theory is the reason why when you sit in a therapist chair, very often they're going to ask you about your childhood environment because our childhood without, you know, conscious effort to like look at it and work with it, our childhood really does drive a lot of our adult behavior. The cool thing is, is because of neuroplasticity, because our brains are capable of creating new neural pathways and changing Once we become conscious of those things, which is what your therapist is trying to help you do, once we become conscious of those things, we now have the keys, we now have the power to reshape or to change those neural pathways so that we can get different results. So Bowlby and Ainsworth decided that it was nurturance and responsiveness that drove human attachment. So if you had caregivers when you were a child that were consistently sensitive to your needs and responded with empathy, warmth, and support, you likely developed a secure attachment. Now, attachment specialist and author Paula Sachs says that these are the five ingredients needed to raise children with secure attachment. So I want you to just kind of sit and listen to these and see if any of these resonate because maybe you had caregivers that did these things. 
I think that in high demand religion, if you find that you resonate with these things, it would be kind of a unicorn situation. But you may have had parents that were able to at least inconsistently provide some of these things. And it'll give you a framework for developing secure attachment in your life if that's what you desire now. So the first thing that Pamela Sachs says is a child must feel safe, but not smothered. So the parent of this child will encourage the child to explore the world around them, to try out new skills, to meet new people, but they're going to stay close enough so the child feels secure and protected. If the child begins to feel frightened or stressed, they know they can turn to the parent for comfort, safety, and support. And once they've emotionally regulated, they're free to venture back out into the world to explore some more. This gives the child the message that they're safe, that they're loved, and that they're lovable. The second thing Pamela says that we need is we need to feel seen and known. So the parent of this child is attuned to or sensitive to the child's needs and responds appropriately. Children in these households know that when they signal a need, they can expect a prompt, predictable, and accurate response. This gives a child a feeling of control over their lives. They know that when they signal they're hungry, they're going to be fed. And when they signal that they're distressed, their caregiver will soothe and comfort them. Now, this becomes problematic, particularly if we have neurotypical parents or if we're taught that certain behaviors are typical and expected or righteous, and we are neuroatypical. This is not just like spectrum disorders. I'm talking about like people with ADHD, with schizophrenia, even just people who have different personalities than their parents or who are developing different attachment styles than perhaps their parents had. So if your parents were prone to project onto you what they might be feeling in that situation, if they were more sympathetic than empathetic. So just a quick, you know, a quick overview of sympathy versus empathy. So sympathy is where you determine what another person might be feeling based on what you would be feeling in that situation. Now, sometimes you'll be right, and often, though, you'll be wrong. So if you had parents that sort of projected onto you what they thought you would be feeling or what you should be feeling based on their own experience, sometimes they might respond in a way that didn't meet your needs. This, I find, really happens in high-demand religion when we're taught that children have emotional outbursts because they're under the temptation of Satan, for instance. If we're taught that that kids have tantrums because of Satan, because of the, you know, the fall of Adam and Eve, that this is part of their worldly fallen nature, and parents need to correct that. So if parents have that idea that they need to correct this in their children instead of comfort and help regulate this in their children, then there's going to be a misattunement, like a a story that the parent projects on the child that isn't accurate, and it will affect the way the parent responds to the behavior. This also happens if you have parents that experience trauma in their childhoods, Sometimes when children react in certain ways, it may trigger a trauma response that reminds them of their own childhood, or if they had a traumatic, you know, relationship with their spouse and their child is acting in a way that reminds them of their spouse, they can respond in ways that project an idea onto the child, and then their behavior matches that instead of being attuned to what the child actually needs or wants. And that requires empathy. That requires understanding that particular child, their needs, their personality, and getting curious with them. Honestly, it takes a lot of curiosity, getting curious with that child to understand their needs and their personality, and then meeting them in that place. And once we understand somebody, once we've gotten curious with them long enough, often we can kind of intuit what they probably 
are experiencing based on their personality and their understanding of the world and what that might be like for them. So for instance, if you're an extrovert and you do social situations just fine, but you have a child that is really struggling emotionally and they're in a crowded space, instead of just being like, oh, they're tired, oh, they're you know hungry, understanding they might be feeling some social anxiety right now. This is a lot of people and a lot of noise, and maybe they need a quiet moment. Getting curious with your child, checking in to see if that's accurate, and then providing them with the quiet to emotionally regulate, and then seeing if they want to go back into the fray with the people. So a child needs to know that they are seen and known, and that their parents want to see them, not a projection of the parent onto them, but that they are seen as an individual and that their actual needs will be met consistently. The third thing Pamela says we need is comfort, soothing, and reassurance. The parent of this child is consistently a warm, comforting place. This doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you don't have bad days. It means that by and large, we're talking 80 to 90% of the time, you are a comforting, soothing, reassuring place. And because there is so much evidence that you're going to be there, those couple of instances when you're distracted or not fully attuned are not going to make a big difference. So this is not talking about perfect parenting, but that you are the majority of the time, and I mean the vast majority of the time, not 50-50. Remember, we have negativity bias, even as little kids. So if your parents are 50% of the time really comforting and soothing and reassuring, but 50% of the time completely ignore you or are angry at you for having needs, your brain is going to weight that 50% of them neglecting you and being angry at you over the 50% of the time that they are comforting and soothing. So it needs to be the vast majority of the time. We're talking 85, 90% of the time. Um, There have been studies that have been done that show it takes eight positive interactions to negate one negative interaction. So it really does need to be like an 80, 90% of the time thing that you're a comforting, soothing, reassuring presence So just just be aware that if your parents were more of a 50-50, you may have developed more of an insecure style because of the negativity bias. And it's not because you're overly dramatic. It's just how your brain works. So when we're kids, we learn to emotionally regulate ourselves by first learning that we can trust our caregivers to help us with co-regulation. So we don't come with emotional intelligence. It's not like we come into this world and we have an innate understanding of our emotions and how to soothe ourselves and regulate. We learn those behaviors from our caregivers. When we're distressed and our caregiver calms and soothes us, we learn that we can internally comfort and calm ourselves. When we're frustrated and our caregiver helps us manage our frustrations, We learn how to do that ourselves. We're taught the tools to manage anger, frustration, disappointment, overwhelm, stress. We learn all of that from our caregivers. And over time, what happens is we learn from these interactions how to internally regulate our own emotions and soothe ourselves. So we come into this world, you know, we don't know how to walk. We don't know how to feed ourselves. We don't know how to go to the bathroom. We don't know how to emotionally regulate. And we learn from this attachment from with our caregivers how to emotionally regulate. If we have secure attachment, our parents or our caregivers are giving us the tools of here's how you deal with anger. Here's how you deal with frustration. Here's how you deal with overwhelm. Here's how you deal with being ecstatic with joy. Here's how you deal with loneliness or being tired. They teach us all the things we need to learn and they give us tools to put in our toolbox that we can then use to regulate our emotions ourselves. When we have a lot of emotionally unregulated people walking around, when we have a bunch of people who are emotionally immature, it's because they weren't given the tools. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to fix it. It would be like, you know, telling a child to fix a leak 
in the faucet and being like, go, but they don't have the tools to do it. They don't have the understanding to do it. They don't know what to do. But if you take a child and you sit down with them and you show them how to correct something with the right tools and you're there to like help them every step of the way, then it wouldn't be impossible for that child to practice those skills and learn how to do it themselves at some point. We, I mean, in history, apprentices would often start at the age of six, seven, or eight. And by the time they were 10 or 12, they were performing the tasks themselves. And this is exactly what we're doing with our emotions is our parents are giving us the tools. They're showing us how to use them. They're modeling for us how they use them. And then eventually we learn how to use them ourselves. The fourth thing Pamela says a securely attached child needs is they need to feel valued. So the parent of this child will regularly express joy about who the child is rather than what the child does. These are the parents who genuinely express joy at getting to be a part of this child's life and watch them blossom into who they someday will become. Now, for those of us who come from high demand religion, this likely didn't happen. You were given a roadmap. You were given a box to fit into. You were told this is who you will become. There wasn't this joyful unfolding. There was this careful molding that was happening. And so in that situation, you're often praised for how you conform. You're praised for how you fit yourself into the box you're not valued for who you are as an individual. You are valued for how you contribute to the collective. And this can really lead to some of that insecure attachment, particularly if your parents were deeply indoctrinated to be a part of the system themselves, they had no other context. So this is one of the bigger ones I find with my clients when it comes to secure attachment is this feeling of not being valued as a person, but rather being valued for how you were a part of the community or a part of the body. What did you do to contribute? How did you serve? Um, How well did you follow the rules? These were the ways that we got our validation instead of just for being ourselves. And the fifth thing that Pamela says a securely attached child needs is to feel supported to explore. So the parent of this child will have a deep faith in their little one. They're both deeply involved in their child's life while simultaneously giving them space to test their autonomy and independence. This sense of security that they always have a safety net as they test out their own wings gives the child the freedom to explore, to discover, to try new things, whether they succeed or fail, either way. This gives a child a strong sense of self-trust that influences all aspects of their lives throughout their adulthood. Now, we talked about this in the episode last week with Catherine Queering. When you're taught that you can't trust yourself, that you must trust God or authorities that speak for God, it really inhibits the sense of self-trust. When we're taught that the world is a scary place and we need to stay inside the fold to stay safe, when we're taught that Satan wants to influence us and trip us up and make us fall, and that we're supposed to seek security and refuge inside of our communities, then of course we don't feel supported to explore. When there are ways to be that are not okay, when if we're gay or bisexual, if we're transgender, then you may have felt this as well, that you weren't safe to explore outside of what was considered okay. And it can really hinder secure attachment. So how do you know if you have a secure attachment style now as an adult? Here are 10 touchstones, if you will, that Pamela Sachs says can help you identify if you are a securely attached adult. First, you're able to regulate your emotions. You're able to both sit with difficult emotions and soothe your emotions. And you ask for emotional support when you need it. Second, you're easily able to bond, open up, and trust others. You generally have a positive view of others, and you trust that your loved ones generally have good intentions. Three, you're comfortable in close relationships as well as being alone. So you can do both. You can have really close, vulnerable relationships, but you also 
are okay if you're on your own. Fourth, you can easily communicate your needs to others. This includes your emotional and physical needs, your boundaries, what's okay and what's not okay with you. You're able to recognize that inside of yourself and then communicate with others clearly and matter-of-factly. Number five, you manage conflict well. Number six, you have a high sense of self-worth. Number seven, you're able to self-reflect in relationships. So you can get curious about your own behavior in a relationship. You can be accountable and you can move forward to resolve any conflict. Number eight, you're able to empathize with others without taking ownership of their emotions. You can get curious with someone about how they're feeling. You can create space for that. You're emotionally available for that without taking ownership of it. Number nine, you trust yourself to be able to set and achieve your personal goals, including your ability to manage the inevitable mistakes and failures along the way. And number 10, you feel worthy of love and you don't need external reassurances of this worthiness. This doesn't mean that you don't enjoy validation when it happens, but you don't need that constant reassurance and validation from others to feel like you're worthy. Now, if you're listening to this podcast because you're on the journey to heal from high demand religion, the whole idea of secure attachment may feel like an unobtainable fairy tale. I want you to know that you're in good company. I have a feeling the majority of us listening to this podcast feel the same. Many of the control mechanisms in high demand religion affected our upbringing in ways that made it very difficult to develop secure attachment with our caregivers and with ourselves. However, I find it helpful to understand secure attachment so that I can recognize that there's a different way to relate to others than the patterns I was taught in childhood, both by my parents and my religious leaders. So we started with secure attachment because I find that it's nice to hear kind of the ideal what we're aiming for, to have a target in mind. And then we're going to talk about the different insecure attachment styles and how we can begin to heal them to move into more secure attachment. So if you crave the kind of secure attachment I described above with yourself and others, stay tuned for the next few episodes. We're going to go through the three types of insecure attachment, how they developed, and how you can begin to heal the wounds that created each of these attachment styles so you can get the connection that you crave. Until then, thank you so much for joining me today, and I will see you next Sunday.